Thank you, Bill Choir. That was beautiful. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church, the first church in Wichita, and also at present, the best kept secret in Wichita. But we would like to change that. Uh, next Sunday is Heritage Sunday. It's a great Sunday to invite family and friends to this service. Uh, we'll be having uh, the processional with the uh, Caledonian um, bagpipers and drum corps and also the recessional and also special music. Uh, we'll be having a concert out on the front lawn as we did in years past. Um, oh, another great kept secret uh, First Christian Church is the archives. How many of you have ever gone and visited the archives? Raise your hand. Um, the archives not only tells the story of the beginnings of this church, it also tells the story in many ways the beginnings of Wichita because we were the first church organized and so if you go up they have all the maps of what Wichita looked like it is amazing to see all that they have and so the archives are going to be open from about 9 o'clock until about 10.15. Uh, we also invite you uh, to have breakfast with us down in the East Dining Room. Uh, that breakfast will begin at 9.30. You see that uh, Heritage Sunday worship starts at 10.30. That's a mistake in the bulletin. It starts at 10.45. But I don't mind if you come at 10.30. Just don't come at 11. So, uh, Also, I want to uh, encourage everyone to sign the friendship pad that should be at the end of each row. And if you are a visitor and you're looking for a church home, we hope that you'll consider us as your place where you can grow in your love for God and your love for neighbor. And now we have a minute for mission uh, for regarding the camp. Uh, Doug Aldridge. Doug, if you come up and share what's happening at the camp today. Good morning from the camp committee. Good morning. It's a beautiful day to be out at our camp. Not just our camp, your camp, God's camp. Um, and even though it's a beautiful day, it's a little chilly this morning. Um, but I'll get to that later. Uh, it's been a busy fall for the camp. Uh, we've uh, had an extreme makeover of two of our restrooms, men's and women's, uh, with new fixtures and features for those of us uh, with, uh, or our guests, with disabilities. And we thank everybody who helped with those efforts as well as other repairs out at the camp uh, this fall, uh, both with the remodeling and other things. Uh, part of the, our busy season was was the flood that we had a couple weeks ago that got some of the lower areas of the camp, uh, but we've recovered quite nicely. Still working on some of it. Uh, we had a work day yesterday uh, that we had a, a number of people out there with us and a lot of volunteers who helped clean and repair and get things ready for the winter. Uh, we were fueled up by donuts in the morning and tacos in the, for lunch. Um, Part of our activities yesterday were to decorate uh, for the fall festival today to which you are all invited, as well as your friends, neighbors, and anybody else who wants to come. Uh, but everybody's invited to celebrate with us the harvest and our many blessings, including the camp. It's certainly not limited to that. Uh, the activities today begin at 3 o'clock. Uh, we've got some non-traditional things like a bounce house, a photo booth, uh, as well as more traditional things like the hay rack rides and uh, well, we're going to have some live music and a haunted walk, cakewalk, egg toss, and a bunch of crafts for the kiddies. So it'll be an interesting day. There'll be Vespers, Vesper services at 5 o'clock. Uh, we've got plenty of tables, but bring your lawn chairs if you're so inclined. Uh, dinner will be about 5.30, uh, and dinner will include a chili cook-off. So bring your prize chili, uh, side salsa, dessert. There's going to be uh, a chili cook-off contest, of course, and there'll be a $5 entry fee for that, but, and there'll be a dessert contest too, but no fee for that. Uh, part of the proceeds will go to a plaque with the uh, names of the chili winners on it. 
And the question of the day is, will the next name on the plaque be someone who is not named Steve Bixler? <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> We can only pray, can we? <laughs> and now those who are able, please stand for the call to worship. The Lord is our dwelling place. A home of peace and plenty. The Lord is our dwelling place. A refuge when trouble is near. The Lord is our dwelling place. A temple that will stand forever. Let us worship God. Let us pray. We give you thanks and praise, O God, that you've called us to this place to hear the promise of your holy word, to be immersed in the font of your grace, and to drink the cup of your blessing. Draw us deeper into your presence and send us out to love and serve. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So let us join together in offering our prayer of confession. First corporately reading aloud and then individually in silence. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you know our sins. We want you to do whatever we ask of you, but we are unwilling to do what you ask of us. We want to sit beside you in your glory, but we fail to stand beside you in your suffering. We want to be first in your great kingdom, but we are among the last to serve the least. Forgive us. Pour out your mercy upon us and wash us clean in your great grace. All this we ask in your holy name. Amen.
It is Jesus the Christ who died, yes, who was raised to life, who is on the right hand of God the Father and is interceding for us. Brothers and sisters, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Please take a moment to share the peace. first reading this morning comes from Hebrews, a passage about the requirements of becoming high priest. So from Hebrews 5, 1 through 10. Every high priest is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those that are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he is able to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as the sins of the people. No one takes this honor upon himself. He must be called by God, just as Aaron was. So Christ did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered, 
and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Thus ends the reading. beautiful. Appreciate it. Your offering to the Lord. Before I read to you the gospel lesson, I want to first say thank you to Gail Farmer, who at the last minute uh, was a substitute for our, uh, for Dick uh, Whelan. Uh, Dick's mother was hospitalized uh, this weekend, and, and Dick went to see his mom. Um, she has been diagnosed. And she's had cancer and been dealing with cancer for four years, and they made a decision this weekend uh, not to get any more treatment. And so um, she went home, and so so Dick is there, and so we need to be lifting up Dick in our prayers as well as his mom and family. So I wanted you to know why Dick wasn't up here, but I appreciate, Gail, your offering to be our liturgist this morning. Our gospel reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, the 10th chapter, verses 17 through 31. You're welcome to follow along with me uh, and the insert that we have provided. For you, listen for God's word addressed to you. 
<clears throat> as Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man run up. No, this is last week's. That's, that's, you know, that's the bad thing when you have an insert that's not this week's. Because I know it's about James and John. The other insert. I said, listen for God's word addressed to you. John, it's Mark 10, 35 through 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to Jesus, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And Jesus said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know among, among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers, lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This ends the reading of God's holy word. May God bless it for our purposes this day. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh, Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. For you are our rock and our Redeemer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Sometimes I wonder if the events described in the Gospel of Mark are not embellished, so to speak, to make a theological point. After all, no one can be as dense as the disciples are described in Mark. They seem as adept and adroit as the keystone cops in silent films. And we know how adept they were at getting their man. And in Mark, we know how adept the disciples are at getting the point that Jesus is going to Jerusalem to die. This request by James and John, the sons of Zebedee, comes immediately after Jesus' third passion prediction in the Gospel of Mark, in which he will say that the Son of Man will be handed over, arrested, beaten, killed, and on the third day rise again. Uh, the Gospel of Matthew um, is a little bit embarrassed by the naked uh, ambition of James and John and doesn't want to believe Mark's version of the count that they were so dense not to understand by the third passion prediction that Jesus is going to Jerusalem to die a martyr's death. So Matthew doesn't have James and John, the sons of Debedee, to ask to sit on his right and his left. He has his mother. Their mother, James and John's mother in the Gospel of Matthew, will ask on behalf of her boys to sit at the right and left. And it goes to show us in so many ways how many of us wish that we had a seed at the table of power and privilege. Who could blame Matthew for having James and John's mother asking 
when you come in glory, can my son sit at your right and your left? Because she wants a return on investment. Do you remember that James and John and the Gospel of Mark are the first ones to be called disciples? They leave their father, Zebedee, in the boat, fishing, and they go off. Now, who's going to run the family business? The Zebedee family has suffered much and sacrificed much for James and John to follow Jesus. And it's only natural they might think, what is my return on investment? And so, if we think about this story, we realize that this story is a much about us. Is it about them? It's as much about our desire to have a seat at the table of power and privilege. We remember wistfully when the mainline churches was the church in the United States. I remember growing up in the 1950s and 60s when there was a Presbyterian church on every corner. And there were not just one first Presbyterian church with a building this side in Charlotte, North Carolina. There were four churches this size in Charlotte, North Carolina. And when the president had the annual prayer breakfast, guess who was on the right and the left? It was the mainline churches. And when it came time to appoint a Supreme Court justice, guess which faith they represented? White Anglo-Saxon Protestant. But now, on the Supreme Court, we have five Roman Catholics, three Jews, and only one white Anglo-Saxon Protestant that represents the main line churches. Do you know who that is? Neil Gorsuch. He's an Episcopalian. And so you see, as our membership has declined in the mainline churches, so much so that now we're called the sideline churches, we do wistfully remember the days when we had a seat at the table on the right and left of people of importance. To be honest, we want our telephone call to be taken when we call our congressman or when we call our senator or when we call our banker. Don't you want the banker to answer your call? Or you call the president of a nonprofit. You really want to be a person of influence. Even ministers want to be persons of significance. I can remember um, going to a funeral. And it was with my Baptist colleague in Monroe, North Carolina. And we were going to the funeral, and I was expecting we would talk about um, the life of the deceased. And I was expecting we would talk about who was going to do what. Uh, but that's not what the conversation was about. Uh, my Baptist colleague in Monroe, North Carolina, what he wanted to know was, was how many were on my membership role. He wanted to know how many I had baptized. He wanted to know what my salary compensation was. How many people did you have in Sunday school? He, it, was, it was all about statistics. And today, if you want to look at the churches that have power and influence, it's the mega churches with the mega pastors, with the mega sized ego. And that's one standard of greatness, I guess. The gospel of success. And some people are better at peddling the gospel of success, of wealth, health, and prosperity uh, than others. I myself don't believe that. I don't believe in the gospel of health, wealth, and prosperity that you hear and see on TV because it has nothing to do with the historical Jesus. 
And what he said about greatness, he had a different measure than success. And so when James and John asked to sit at his right and left when he comes in glory, Jesus will tell James and John that that is not his to grant for that decision has already been made. But can they be baptized with the baptism he is about to undergo? And can they drink the cup that he's about to drink? And they say yes. And Jesus was talking about the baptism of death. He was talking about the cup of suffering. They didn't realize it at the time. But after the resurrection, James and John will be one of the first that will be martyred for the faith. And so, we have Jesus giving a different measure of success, a different measure of greatness. And he will say, you know how the Gentiles uh, lorded over their subjects and even the great ones are tyrants, but not so with you. I can imagine they were probably thinking about Caesar and the Romans and their occupation and how they imposed the peace of Rome and when anyone got out of line, the way the Romans got people back in line is they would crucify the troublemakers. In Galilee, when people rebelled against taxation, they crucified 3,000 in 6 B.C. And so you can imagine the people who hear Jesus' words are thinking about the Romans. And if they think about the history of Israel, they're probably thinking about Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. And if they go even further back, they're probably thinking about Assyria and Tiglath Pileser. But we don't have to think that far. We can just think about the present rulers today. And we can think about what's in the newspapers today and on the airways. And you can think about the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, do you not? And what happened to one who was asking for the freedom of the press and dared to criticize the crown prince. And so we know what happens to those who impose tyrannical rule upon their subjects. Yes, Saudi Arabia is a country of great wealth and great power. But that's not the measure that Jesus wants his disciples to look at. He talks about a different kind of greatness. He says, but not so with you. For the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom of many. The definition of greatness, according to Jesus, is not who serves you, but who do you serve? If we are honest with ourselves in our weakest moment, haven't we sometimes wished that we had a personal assistant? Have you not? Wish that they could do all the things that you were tasked to do for that day? Wouldn't life be easier if I just had a personal assistant? It's not about who serves you. It's about who you serve and who you follow. And I have a thing, have a feeling that greatness is not going to be seen on a big screen or on a reality TV show. I have a feeling that greatness doesn't have anything to, about, to do with the Kardashians. You know? I really don't. I think greatness has to do with people who serve quietly and humbly. That when it comes time to clean up after a church function, they're one of the first in the kitchen. And you don't even have to ask them. They're there. Or when the call goes out for volunteers to drive for the transportation committee, and they do need people to drive, they're there. 
or when a call goes out to take care of our church grounds once a month on the second Saturday, they're there. They don't have to be asked. And they wouldn't even want to be recognized. I, um, I'm of the, of the persuasion that when I volunteer for something and, and I'm doing something, I would like for people to recognize it and say, Brent, you did a good job. Or uh, I would like, uh, you know, or if, uh, if the work is hard, I might grumble about it. You know, I can't believe they're asking us to do this or that. You know, uh, my mother was a great volunteer. She volunteered in the nursery for 30 years at her church. But my mother would never be described as a silent martyr. Do you know what I mean? She let everybody know about the sacrifice that she was making. That's not the kind of greatness. We, in the church, when it talks about servant leadership, sometimes we have a feeling that, yes, I'll serve, but I want everybody to know what I'm serving and the sacrifices I'm making, and I really want a return on investment. But I think real greatness isn't about presuming that when people don't volunteer to serve a particular pet cause that we have in the church, that we don't make a judgment value upon those who don't volunteer. Um, as uh, this woman in the church that I grew up that my mother could not stand. My mother, I told you she was a saint. But uh, there was a woman, her name was Mrs. Kathy. And she would get up when it comes announcement time and uh, she would say, I just know that everyone who loves the Lord will do this. And my mother was serving in the nursery for 30 years and she could never get a volunteer. But she said to me under her breath, I guess I don't love the Lord because I'm not doing what Mrs. Kathy wants me to do. <laughs> So, it's not about us making those value judgments about who's not serving, and it's not about us griping when we do serve. A true measure of greatness is about the one we follow. Because of the one we follow, the one who showed us how to wash the disciples' feet because of love. Love for the other needs to be the motivating factor. And so, James and John didn't get it. They were following Jesus, but for the wrong reasons. Let us this day understand that the true measure of greatness is following Jesus for the right reason. For love. And only love. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our response is an affirmation of faith. And those who are able, please stand. And all of God's people said, we trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel, unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition. Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit.
Amen. And now we will have Tom Warner to come forward for the prayers of the people, and you may be seated. Will all of you that love the Lord please bow your heads? <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we ask you to look down on First Presbyterian Church and, and all of our empty pews. We ask you to give us guidance and strength that we maybe go forth in the downtown area of Wichita and find people who want to worship with us. We ask you to give us strength and to give us knowledge and to help us. Also ask you to bless the Bells and their loss and, and Dick Whelan and his family and, and their impending loss. We ask you to just love us all, be with us when we hurt, and Provide us with the care and assistance that we all require. In Jesus' name, amen. And will you bow your heads for the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art, art in heaven, hallowed be, be thy, thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come thy, thy will, will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily, daily bread, and, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now Carol Blumenschein will come up and have... Great. Our call to stewardship. The theme this year is partnering with God through stewardship. The scripture is taken from Matthew chapter 25, the parable of the three serv servants, which reads in part, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. As Christians, we are called to be faithful stewards and partners with our Lord and Savior through stewardship, like the two stewards in these verses, not like the hoarding stewards, like the third steward in Matthew 25, 25, who hid his talent in the ground. Or, not like Scrooge, when asked to give, answered, a poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. Or, old man Potter from It's a Wonderful Life. Oh, I suppose I should give my money to miserable failures like you and that idiot brother of yours to spend for me. History and fiction are full of many stories of those who died poor even though they had lots of money. Most commercials promise to save you money, but only if you spend it on, on their product. Maybe a better idea is to build up savings in God's heavenly kingdom by spending money on his earthly kingdom. As we approach this season of giving, please remember to partner with God, who is the source of all our gifts. God loves a cheerful giver, so smile when you make your pledge. From the highest of highs to the depths of the sea, creations revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring, 
every creature unique in the song that it sings all exclaiming indescribable uncontainable you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name you are amazing god all-powerful, untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim, you are amazing God. Who has told every lightning bolt where it should go? Or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow? Imagine the sun and give source to its light Yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night None can fathom Indescribable, uncontainable You place the stars in the sky And you know them by name You are amazing God Powerful, untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim, you are amazing God. Indescribable, uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name, you are amazing God. Powerful, untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim, you are amazing God. Indescribable, uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name, you are amazing God. Incomparable, unchangeable, you see the depths of my heart and you love me the same. You are amazing God. You are amazing God. You are amazing God. Father, receive these, our humble gifts. We dedicate them for your purpose to this church and its members. We pray that you give us strength and courage to spread your glory, mercy, and grace throughout the land, not by declarations, but by service to the least and to the suffering. Father, magnify these offerings for your use to the glory of your holy name. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Go in grace to serve the Lord with joy and gladness in your heart. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh.